watching from home. Um, we are Disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. United, United in spirit, spirit and inspired by God's, God's grace, we welcome all, love all, and seek justice for all. May God's peace be with you. And, and also with you. Turn to 735 in your hymnals. Yes. And we're going to read it responsively. Okay. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. The, the world, world and, and those who live, live in it. it. For God has founded it on the seas. And established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek God, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors that the, the king, king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. And be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, to you no door is shut and no heart is closed. Stand among us in your risen power. Help us to envision that in the strength of your spirit, you give us power over our struggles. May our worship this morning transform us so that we might know God in all his glory. This we pray in your name, even as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. We will now sing He Lives, which is number 226 in your hymnal, and we will be singing stanzas 1 and 3. Oh, Christian, lift up your voice and sing. 
some extra editing on this video to uh, get rid of the places where we had to start and stop several times. Does anybody have any um, prayer requests? I'll give you extra time to think about it while I go close this door. Any prayer requests? Don. We definitely want to pray for the war in Europe and all the countries that are threatened or being bombed, even as we speak. We want to pray for our community as we celebrate our festival for the first time in Three years. We had one soon after I got here in 2019 and haven't had one since. So all the traditions that surround the Maple Festival are sort of brand new to me again because I didn't get much experience with them before. I made the mistake yesterday of going to the pharmacy in the afternoon. <laughs> that was something I'll never repeat. <laughs> I thought I'd just run over there and pick up something. I could have waited until Monday. I like to never found a way over there, but I did, and I found a way back home eventually. Well, let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks on this beautiful spring morning for your presence around us and within us. We thank you for the beauty of nature, and we thank you for the people in our lives, especially this day we're thankful for our community, and we're thankful for the return of our annual celebration that's held in late April. We just ask your blessings upon each person that is attending the festival. We ask that you keep them safe and that you bring them joy. We ask that our witness for you be visible in our community. As people pass by our church, may they know that we stand for we stand for the love of you and your son. We ask that as they pass our peace pole that they say an extra little prayer for peace. And we ask that as the joyful hymns of Easter play out through our carillon, that they hear that and that they know that your son Jesus Christ is alive, that he is risen, and that he dwells among us. We lift up to you those those situations and those people in the world who most need your help, especially this day, we pray for the people of Ukraine and we pray for a change in the hearts of the Russian leadership. We ask that that war end and that it, especially that it not expand. We pray for those people that we are concerned about, those people in our hearts that we name before you in silence at this moment. These prayers we lift up to you in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, God forevermore. Amen. I will be reading today from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I'm just going to do sort of a little Bible study of... Um, what Jenny just read, we read from the same scripture that is appointed to be read every single year on this Sunday. This is the story that you all probably know as the Doubting Thomas, and we'll probably talk a little bit into this sermon about why that's not a good name for this story, the Doubting Thomas, and we also might discover why it's not really even fair to Thomas. So let's take a look at what Jenny just read for us. First of all, it opens on Easter evening. And that's important because when you think about it, the only time of year that we can pinpoint as these are the days that these things actually happened on are the, the events before and after Easter. We all know that Christmas didn't really happen in December. We don't know when Jesus was born. It probably was not in December, and so we celebrate Christmas with great joy, but we also acknowledge that that is a date that we have decided upon when Jesus probably wasn't really born. But there's no question about when Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and the, the days following Easter actually happened. And so we measure those according to the Jewish festival of Passover, and so we know exactly when they occurred. It happened. The resurrection of Jesus happened on the Sunday during Passover. Passover is about a week long. And so the resurrection happened on the Sunday during Passover. And we have the disciples here gathered in a house. We don't know where the house was, but the house is here. And the disciples are gathered in this house. And we don't have an actual um, number of the disciples, but according to John... The disciples are all of the disciples. John, when he talks about the disciples, he's not talking about the 12, or at this point, the 11. He's not talking about those in particular. He's talking about all the disciples. And remember, at this point, there weren't very many, but there would, there would have been more than 12. Probably Mary Magdalene would have been among those who were here, but there were probably maybe a couple of dozen people who had followed Jesus up until the end, but they were now afraid. Jesus had been crucified, he had been killed, he had been executed by the Romans. So here they were gathered in this room for fear of the religious authorities, who they knew now were against them because of what had happened to Jesus. And when Jesus appears to them, you might think at first he's a ghost because he comes through a closed door. They had the doors locked because they were afraid. Jesus comes among them, but the first thing he does is prove he's no ghost. He's not just a spirit, he is a physical presence. Because what does he do? He shows them the marks of his crucifixion. They see immediately that this is not a ghost, this is not a spirit, this is the physical presence of the one that they loved and the one that they had seen crucified, most of them from afar, just a few days earlier. And this is Easter night. Now, when he, when he speaks to them, the first thing he says to them is, peace be with you, which perhaps wasn't all that unusual because that is still the greeting that Hebrew people would share with each other. Shalom, peace be with you. And even in the Arabic world, that is what 
um, Arabs would say to each other, peace be with you, salam instead of shalom. That's a common greeting in that part of the world in those languages. But Jesus came among them and said, peace be with you. It wasn't just a greeting. It was actually a powerful expression of what he had come to do. He came to bring them peace because they were gathered behind locked doors. They were afraid. They were agitated. Their spirits were not at peace. And so when Jesus came and granted them peace, it was truly granted. Jesus' words had power at that point. And then he did something important. Remember I said just a few minutes ago, when John speaks of the disciples, he's not just speaking of the, the top 10 or the top 12. He's talking about all Christians. All those who had followed Jesus to the end, and even though they were afraid, they still were following Jesus. He came to them and he said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And that's important. Because they were suddenly not just disciples, they were apostles. Because that's what an apostle is. A person who is sent to share a message. And what was the message that he sent them to share? Not just the top few disciples, but all disciples. And that includes us at this point. The message that he sent them to share was that they were filled with the Spirit to forgive sins or to retain sins. You have the power to forgive sins, and if you do, they are forgiven. And you have the power to retain sins, and if you do, they are retained. Now, there's no evidence in the Gospels that Jesus expected people to hold people's sins against them. But it's something we have to admit, that if we do retain the sins of any, it affects not just them, but us. Forgiveness is the key. There are times when sometimes we can't forgive. Something horrible has happened to us, and we are unable to forgive what has happened. And when we retain those sins, they are retained not just with the person who we can't forgive. They're also retained in us. It creates brokenness within us. And so the goal is always to get to the point of forgiveness. It may not come immediately but it should come eventually because only in letting go of someone else's sins do we not retain them within ourselves. Forgiveness is always the key. And of course, that's something we pray in the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? We don't pray in the Lord's Prayer to retain the sins of people. We pray that God will forgive us as we forgive others their debts. Um, and so Jesus sends them forth with this message, this message of forgiveness. And the message should be always to get to the point of forgiveness, even if at the beginning that is difficult. And a week later, and that's why we always read this on the Sunday after Easter, a week after Easter evening, the same thing is going on. The disciples are gathered in a room, in a house, and Thomas, who wasn't with them before, is with them again. The disciples had already said what had happened, and Thomas said, well, I won't, believe, I won't believe what you saw unless I see the same thing that you saw. And so it's not fair to Thomas to call him the Doubting Thomas, because remember when Mary came back to the disciples and said, I've seen the Lord, they didn't believe her. And so the disciples say to Thomas, who wasn't there, we've seen the Lord, and Thomas says, well, unless I see what you saw, I also am going to be an unbeliever in what you're telling me. And that's something that's important because nowhere in this, in this scripture is the word doubt or doubter or doubting used. So Thomas says, I won't believe unless I too can not just see but touch the nail prints or the place where the spear was was put through Jesus' side. Unless I can see and feel those things, I am going to be just like you were last week. I'm not going to believe. And of course, suddenly, Jesus appears among them in the same way. Not just a ghost, but a physical presence. And he says to Thomas exactly what Thomas needs. And that's a message for us as well. Jesus meets us at the point of our need. Jesus meets us at the point of our unbelief. 
We could even say doubt here, even though John never actually used the word doubt. He said, Thomas, here I am. You see my nail prints, you see my scars, put your hand there. Now it doesn't say whether or not Thomas actually did it. He could have done it. Jesus invited him to do it. But Jesus, um, after Jesus' response to, or invitation to Thomas, Thomas's immediate response is the greatest confession that we have anywhere in the Gospels. The deepest and most profound confession of his belief in Christ. He says, my Lord and my God. Jesus had said to him, in the Bible it says, do not doubt but believe, that's our translation. The actual Greek says, do not be unbelieving but believe. Don't be an unbeliever but be a believer. And so when he says this, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Basically, every teaching that, that Christ had ever shared with them in the Gospel of John is summed up in Thomas' response. And nowhere else in the Scriptures do we have such a strong confession of faith. My Lord and my God. And then Jesus says to him something that probably nowhere else in the Scriptures, or at least in the Gospels, is Jesus talking so clearly not to those disciples there, but to us, a few of us. We're not even as many as the 12 disciples today, are we? He's talking to us today. He said, do you believe because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And he is really speaking to us. Not only does he make all disciples apostles in this scripture, Remember, it's not just the 12, it's all of them. He grants the same kind of power to, to forgive sins and to go forth and share his message of love. Grants it to all of us here. He says, not only am I talking to those who are here tonight who see me, but all of those in the future, not just in the future this year or while I'm still on earth before I go back to the Father, not even the first century, but... 20 centuries later, 21 centuries later, he's talking to us. Those of us who have not seen and yet have come to believe, we are no less blessed than those who were there to see him crucified, to experience his resurrection firsthand, and who, on whom he breathed the Holy Spirit that night. And I think that's something that we all need to remember. We are no less a Christian than the first people who met Jesus face to face and those who were around to experience his resurrection. Now, Luke has a different time frame of, about when, when all these things happen. Pentecost happened 50 days after Easter in the book of Luke. But here in John, we see that immediately after the resurrection, Jesus granted his followers the Holy Spirit. So still today, I think Jesus is breathing on us and granting us a mission, a mission of love to go forth and forgive. There will be times like right now with the war in Ukraine. There will be times when we aren't yet ready to forgive. How can we forgive the leaders of a country who are sending bombs that are even now killing grandparents and children, destroying buildings unnecessarily? I'm not ready at this point to forgive because they're still doing it. But the time has to come when all of us forgive the things that seem at this point to be unforgivable. And the power of the Holy Spirit breathed upon us by Jesus is what enables us to do that. And that is what spreads the message of the gospel of love. Amen. So our song is going to be 224, a very old evangelical sort of Easter song, Christ Arose, verses 1 and 3, 224.
And after the benediction, we'll sing our response. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go forth in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.